our first speaker. Let's give it up for Jory. All right, thank you, Pastor Pradeepin. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Jory. It's really nice to meet you all, and I'm very honored to be speaking with you this morning. Um, I am going to be talking with you a little bit about the armor of God. And, um, oops, sorry about that. Before I get into, um, wow, my iPad just like freaked out. Before I get into um, what I want to talk about, um, I think it will be great to just go ahead and read the verse about the armor of God. Um, so Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints. Amen. Amen. So um, when Pastor Amritha asked me if I was interested in speaking on this topic, I thought this was a really interesting coincidence because like Pastor Pradeepin said, I am a, a character artist in the video game industry. And as a character artist, um, I actually make armor all of the time. If you've ever played a video game or uh, watched someone play a video game, then you'll be um, aware that oftentimes those characters are wearing armor. So um, I thought there's an interesting parallel here between um, wearing the armor of God as followers of Jesus and uh, things that you do in a video game that pertain to armor. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there is an image, if you guys could put it up on the screen. Great, thank you so much. Um, so there's three points here that I want to highlight, and before I go into them, um, I'll give you a brief explanation of what this is. This is a player character. Um, if you're a big nerd like me, you will know this is from the world of Warcraft. Um, and what I mean by player character is I mean that this is a character that a player created. So if you look around the character, uh, there are all these different squares, and then inside those squares you can see items, and those items are actually armor. Um, so the first uh, point that I want to talk about is, you know, in a video game, um, you have all of these slots allotted to you. And you want to fill all of those slots with armor because they will protect you and they will equip you to be able to accomplish whatever it is that you need to accomplish uh, in the game that you're playing. And I think that this is um, a strong parallel for us as Christians, right? God has given us a full suit of armor, not a partial suit of armor. So yeah. as believers, we want to equip all of it, not just the helmet, not just the breastplate, yeah. but you want to fill all the slots. Yeah. Uh, second thing I want to talk about is... Um, in a video game, you don't just arbitrarily equip armor pieces. You want to choose uh, the specific breastplate that is going to best suit you and your character for whatever you need to carry out, however you're going to serve your teammates. So um, it's not just about equipping armor for the most basic purpose, which is avoiding death. Um, as Christians, Jesus has already paid that price for us. Yeah. We don't need yeah. to worry about avoiding death. That's not why you know, the armor of God is being offered to us. It's being offered to us so that we can optimize and we can um, really highlight our abilities yes. as unique followers of Jesus. Wow. So every, everybody's armor is going to look different, and that is great because we are all different parts of the body. Yeah. 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 And now the third thing I want to talk about um, is in games, and this is arguably one of the most important things, is you're not just getting equipped for yourself. You're getting equipped to be of service to your teammates. Um, so this is true in the Christian walk, right? We want to equip ourselves so that we can better serve our brothers, sisters in Christ, so that we can encourage them um, to equip themselves, and so that we can also give them confidence that we're going to be there with them, we're going to be able to fight alongside them. And in addition to that, you know, in a game, it's not just about you, it's not just about your comrades, it's also about whoever you're facing, whether that's like an in-game creature or boss, or, you know, if you're playing like a player versus player, 
game, then you want to uh, make sure whoever you're fighting is aware that you're ready for battle. And this is true as followers of Jesus, right? Like Paul said, we're not fighting just against flesh and blood. This is against powers and principalities. And so when we are fully equipped in our armor, um, this is an affront to Satan and his demons and the evil in this world. We're showing that we're ready. We're ready for battle. So um, my challenge to you is to get fully equipped, get fully suited, optimize your armor, make sure it suits you as an individual follower of Jesus. Um, be the light that Jesus has called you to be. A light on a hill cannot be hidden. And I want you to picture yourself, you know, in your armor with the sun shining on you uh, off the smooth surface of your weapon. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you in game and ready for battle. Thank you. Yes. Come on. Well done, Jory. Awesome. Love it. All right. Let's give it up for Abhijit. Yeah. Woo! Yes. That was nice. And, uh, yeah. So, thanks, Pastor Pradipan and Amrit, Pastor Amrita, like, you know, giving this opportunity. I'm Abhijit. Um, you'll get my name probably slowly after yes. a few times. I, Daniel today has said, like, Abhijit. Yeah, you got it. So, <laughs> so uh, I come from a very small town in India with only 15 million people probably in that <laughs> place. It's called Calcutta. <laughs> um, so we have been here for almost 10 years in the US, traveled across many times. And one thing my dad used to always talk about, like, hey, like we've been married for 15, 18 years now. And all the time after marriage, my dad will, whenever I call, he'll say like, are you going to a church? Like, you know, like he's asking me, are you actually rooted in the word of God <laughs> as a family? So I'll be talking about rooting. It's very important um, in our life and also for believers in Christ. Um, so I'll start with a verse out here. Um, it's from Ephesians. I've been doing the Bible study group with Ephesians. And I don't know, Pastor Pradeepan was also speaking about Ephesians in the church. I didn't know that. <laughs> so it was, it was good. So I'll just read from Ephesians 2 uh, books. Um, two chapters from there. So in Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, uh, listen carefully out here. Like, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. That's Ephesians 9, 1, 19, 20. In Ephesians 2, later, Five and six, it says, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Two things out here. First, he raised him up and seated him at the right place. That's Christ. And later, he raised us up and seated us with him. Raised him, seated him, raised us, seated us. It's the positional truth yeah. every believer needs to know. It is the most important part. Um, in the next slide, like, a Christian, it is very important, grasp this. Christian experience does not begin by walking, but by sitting mm -hmm. so first. I come from India. There's many religions there. I've grown up in places like my neighbors and Muslims, Hindus. Christian walk is not by walking. We don't do by working. Right. Yeah. Christ has already done. It is finished. That is a statement. Amen. He did it. And we don't do by going thousands miles pilgrimage or doing this. We cannot please God. But God cannot be pleased. Christian experience is not by walking, but by sitting in that positional truth, what Christ has done for me. And it is very important to know that and grasp inside our heart. The more we are rooted, the next one, the more we are rooted upwards in the realization of this positional truth that God seated him and then seated us along with him, the more we are firmly rooted in the walk with Christ in the earthly realm. Amen. 
our roots are not downwards, it's upward. The more we are upward, we are firmly standing on the ground. The more we firmly stand, we are more sharing the love. In Ephesians 3.17, um, it says, The Christ may dwell in, our, in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. Think that, like you may be rooted and grounded in love. As we realize more of our walk in this earth and in the community, the more deeply rooted as we are receiving it from the Christ. I'll end this um, with an illustration, um, which is um, like Pastor Pradeepan has been to uh, Redwood Forest yeah. recently. I was living in San Francisco for a long time when I came to US and you know, San Francisco, like I used to go to Muir Woods, that's also a, like a Redwood Sequoia Forest. And it's amazed to see um, these trees and images um, if you have seen like these long trees, even in the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of long trees, tall. So when I was seeing like, it is, uh, historian says like these trees are there for thousands of years. Some of them dates back 4,000 of years old, like 3,000 years old. It's amazing to just think that these trees may be there when Jesus was walking on the earth wow. <laughs> in those perspective. The important part, these trees can go 300 feet tall and you know, they're like 30 feet of sometimes in diameters and their roots only go like 10 to like 30, 15 feet down. But the most important part, like they have been studying, standing tall for ages and years, like thousands of years. You know how? Their roots are always interconnected. Wow. It's as if like they're holding each other. Hey, wow. I got you. Their roots go down and deep and they're connected, you know, they're nourishing each other, they're like encouraging each other and holding each other. That's the body of Christ out Man, here. Come on. We are holding each other because Christ has done it, it is finished. We are holding and we'll be standing tall. Like, be rooted in Christ, in his forgiveness. Be rooted Man. in the foundation of what God has done and be rooted in the word of God. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Great job, Abhijit. All right. Let's give it up for Sarah. Come on. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. And as we continue to dive into Ephesians, uh, we'll take a look at how our identity in Christ positions us to fully receive and live out in confidence. Uh, so first, let's define identity. Uh, the main question we ask is, who am I? Often we feel pressure to define ourselves through our jobs, financial status, marital status, achievements, grades, appearance, what people say about us, and many other means. So what happens to our identity when we experience failure or lose someone's favor? Personally, I have found that the very foundation of how I view myself gets shaken and altered when I fail. When I fall short, I feel the need to prove to people or myself by hustling to make up for my lack. Uh, my mind spirals into negative thoughts, trapped with guilt and shame, and I start to question my worth and significance, which leaves me feeling anxious, disappointed, dissatisfied, and defeated. A couple of Sundays ago, I was up here sharing my testimony and briefly mentioned that some time ago, I was in a long-term relationship with someone which had ended horribly. And by that, I mean I was on the receiving end of rejection. What followed were feelings of intense insecurity, low sense of self-worth, playing the comparison game, and so on. During this time, I could not help but to believe in the false beliefs of inadequacy and being unloved. And when the pandemic hit, I got laid off. So as in dealing with my shaken sense of self, having no job, I began to feel completely insignificant. I just felt like a failure. I was faced with the realities of all that I did wrong. Until this year, uh, God began a new work in me. Wow. Wow. 
I've realized that a stable sense of self of I've realized that a stable sense of self cannot fully exist when we place our identity in external things because when our circumstances change, our identity constantly changes too. When you are stripped of the things and people you are attached to, you see where you place your significance and where your security lies. The thing is, I desire to be significant. I can't live without it. And the wonderful thing is, God says you already are significant. Wow. So when we start looking deeper to the core of our existence, we are much more than our doing and our circumstances. Our identity comes from our being, who God says we are. Uh, if we can take a look at Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, we are his workmanship. You and I are his workmanship. We are God's masterpiece. I'm thinking to myself, masterpiece? Don't you see what I've done? Um, don't you see all my flaws? He says, yeah, I made you. But because God has placed our identity in him first, we are able to live out his beautiful purposes for us. Yeah. Not the other way around, having to prove first in order to, in order to achieve our identity. He understands my past and my mistakes, but has given me a future. He has given us a future. We are God's masterpiece first. And we can believe in that because, as we see here in uh, Ephesians 1 through 4, or sorry, Ephesians 1, chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. <laughs> Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So God has chosen us before the foundation of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Who we are has already been made known before we could begin to define ourselves, yeah. before the world was even set, before we took our first breath. In him, he sees us as holy, meaning blemish-free, blameless, meaning we have freedom from the guilt of our shortcomings and failures, and we are his workmanship which in Greek means poem. Uh, God wrote a beautiful poem about our lives, ready for us to step into. The doing is the result in our understanding of our being. Because of this newfound identity, my attitude has completely changed. I've learned that I'm not defined by my circumstances and failures. My security now rests in him, in his love for me. We may not be able to avoid the disappointments of rejection or the discouragement of falling short, but we will not be defined by our circumstances or believe the labels we place on ourselves. Because our true identity is that we are already lovingly chosen and created as his masterpiece in Christ Jesus, in whom we have new birth to fully live out in boldness and confidence in knowing who we are in him. So I encourage you to rest in knowing who you are already in Christ and go and to go forward as new creations in him. Thank you. Amen. So good. Love it. Love it. Well, I want to introduce our next speaker who is not physically with us. This is Charles Lohr. He has prepared a video for us. And honestly, he is one of the most unique people we've ever pastored because he said, hey, I want to share my testimony with you. And I said, yeah. And he's like, all right, when can I come over and set up my system? I was like, what? <laughs> so he walked over to our house, and he set up a virtual reality system to share his testimony with us. And he literally showed us where he grew up, <laughs> where he fell in love with the Lord. Just amazing. And so he's not feeling very well, so it seems very fitting that he was able to record his five minutes of fire, his five-minute message for us today. And so Charles is an amazing man of God. You'll see probably at our camping trip on in a few weeks, he has a double-decker hammock that goes about 20 feet into the trees, and he sleeps up there. He's a man of the nature, a man of technology. Let's give it up for Charles and I. Hey, I'm Charles. I'm sick this week. Uh, it's probably just a cold. I did get a rapid test, came back negative for COVID, but I just didn't want to spread it. Thank um, you. But I wanted to talk to you guys about an experience that happened um, surrounding unity. 
uh, unity in the body of Christ when I was much younger in my faith. Um, I was saved at 24, and so all this happened maybe about a year after that. Um, I just felt called down, called to go down to Washington, D.C. and pray um, on the, the National Mall, uh, sometimes for the nation, sometimes for my friends. And I lived in Baltimore at the time, so it was only about an hour uh, down and an hour back um, trek. And so I would go down two, three weekends a month and pray and head back. And one weekend, or one week, I had an atheist coworker ask me, hey, what are you going to do this weekend? And nervously, I said, well, I'm going to go down to D.C. and pray. Um, and he said, oh, I'll be there too. There's this huge atheist rally I'll be at. And I was like, hmm, D.C. is a big place. Probably not going to be the same thing. It's going to be fine. Uh, and sure enough, no. When I came up the escalator stairs, right in the middle of where I had been praying all the weeks before, there was 30,000 atheists all screaming things, which made me a little bit uncomfortable. I very shortly found this one Christian who was alone handing out tracts, and, and I wanted to pray with him, but he, he was really kind of urgent. He, he, we did pray, but only briefly, because he pointed out the, the importance of reaching these people, because like, if one of them didn't make it home and they didn't know the Lord, they'd be lost for forever. I, I kept looking around and I found a bunch of Christians over on one side, some holding up banners which were, which were loving, but others which were um, very condemning. And I, I found a bunch of groups where the Christians were just squabbling amongst each other, being egged on by the atheists, by, by just them like rooting down and just arguing about these nuances while the gospel was being just almost neglected. Um, there were, however, some, some atheists there who had just never heard the gospel, who were just totally, they had heard things and seen things that they had never heard or seen before. And, um, and one of them was, I'm going to call him B., uh, talking to this one kind of crusty Christian who kept cutting him off and, and blocking him and saying, well, if we can't agree about this, then we can't agree about anything. If we can't agree about this particular, like the meaning of this verse, we can't agree on anything. And he was really specific. It was, it was very hard for, for B to understand when, when all B was wondering was just some of the basics of faith. Um, and sort of the squabbling amongst the Christians just really got in the way of that. And uh, so I had ended up talking to B for a while, along with some other Christians who were just more focused on that. And, and at one point, B had asked, like, can you, can you pray with me? Like, I, I want to know more about, about God. And I found the, the original Christian he was talking to, and I said, hey, B wants us to pray with him. And the original Christian said, oh, I don't pray with non-Christians. And you could see Berna's face drop. And I, I quickly retorted, like, pray for, pray for, pray for. Um, but the amount of injury that happened by that sort of separation, by that, that wanting to squabble over these, these individual pieces of what would be true in the Bible, um, really got in the way of the mission. So we prayed for him and chatted a bit longer, and, and everything was kind of over and, and all disseminated. Um, but... It was just really hard for, for me at that time to, to really reconcile that. And I had to, on the way back, God had kind of poked at me and said, if you really dig your heels in on some of these things, you'll be just like that one Christian who, the one crusty Christian who was just arguing about these things, which in the grand scheme of things didn't matter as much as saving someone's soul. So this brings me to Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. And it's, uh, it's about unity. It's, as a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient and bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God, one Father, of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. So I encourage you guys, find the areas where you're squabbling over these things which don't matter, and unite with other believers for the sake of, of his kingdom and for, for the individual souls that can be saved. Thanks. Thank you, Virtual Charles. Love it, love it. So give them some virtual love if you can today. And we have our last five and five speaker, Luke Gilson. Woo! Hey, everybody. 
oh, when I was like last on the list, I was a bit nervous. I was like, but seeing all your faces through the lights has kind yes. of like set me, yeah. <laughs> set me at peace. So glad to be here. Like I'm speaking on spiritual blessings and a little bit on spiritual giftings, but like Ephesians is just packed full of this stuff. So I just had to pull on one little like thread of it to be able to fit it into five minutes. Uh, so yeah, so let's go. First slide, please. And my, my first point is really, like, key to all my other ones. They all kind of hinge off this. And it is that, like, God the Father is the source of all spiritual blessings. So it's like the, the first verse that Paul says after his greetings is, Blessed is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. It's like there's so much in that verse. But the, the thing that I just want to say is, like, at the start, blessed is God. So God is the blessing, and then he is the one that pours out on us. And James 1.17, which you alluded to earlier, is, uh, is so in agreement with this. And it says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. It's just like, so that's it. Like, that is, that is God and who he is. And, and it's not like he has to go out and, like, buy the gifts, or prepare the gifts. Like, it's, he doesn't have to look for them. It is his absolute nature okay so like it is who he is he is love he is life he is hope he is the source of truth and so another really important point is that wherever the presence of God rests wherever he dwells there is just a natural outpouring of abundance of life of love and so that that's kind of my first point and that like he just longs to lavish that on us he wouldn't even hold back Jesus um, so then my next point is, like, how, how does God plan to do this? Like, what is God's plan? And, and I think Ephesians has a really cool answer. And it says, yeah, Ephesians 1.10, like, in Christ, in Christ, God's plan for the fullness of time is to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And, and doesn't that kind of make sense? Like I said, God is the source and so if you bring all things to him, joining them to him, doesn't, isn't that like a perfect answer and solution? Like we can then live with that fullness. And Ephesians says that Jesus on the cross, he defeated sin. And that allowed us to come boldly to approach God in the Holy of Holies. And, and Ephesians goes further to say that the Spirit actually allows us, we are chosen to be the new Holy of Holies, we are being dwell, sorry, built into the new holy temple. And that's where God dwells. And so like I said in that first point, like where God dwells, that's where we should expect to see abundance as we are built up into that temple. Okay, and I have a little picture for you, just like a visual aid. And uh, <laughs> I hope you can read it. But for some reason over my life, like God has spoken to me a few times in toilets. I don't know what it is, but I've had encounters and revelations. And this is one of them. And I took this picture maybe six years ago, somewhere in Asia. And I was just like, isn't, isn't this God? So this was above a urinal. And it says, come close, please. Automatic flushing as you draw near. And isn't that like God? Like as we draw near to God, there is just like automatic flushing. Like the, <laughs> yeah. amen. Yeah. That's, there's a, yeah, there's a flushing of our sin, right? And our hearts become aligned with him. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we no longer want to do what we used to, but we do what he wants. And so that's actually my last point, is the blessing of transformation. And this is all throughout Ephesians, but there's a verse that I love that I want to pull from, 1 John 3. And this is talking about when Jesus comes back at the end of times. And it says, we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we shall see him as he is. Wow. And I was like, what? It's just because we see him? I was like, what? So I read a bunch of translations and they all say the same thing. It's like there is power in revelation of wow. Christ. Amen. There is just like transformational power in just seeing him for as he is. And that is a truth for like then. And I also believe it holds like firm for now. Amen. And so, like, when Paul in Ephesians is saying, I want you to comprehend the love of Christ, the height, the depth, the breadth, the, the fullness of that, it's so that we can behold him and be transformed yes. to be in his likeness. Yes. And then, like, chapter 4, it just says more. It says, put on the new self, created in the likeness of God. 
It's like, what? Like, we're made to be in the likeness of God. Chapter 5, be imitators of God. And this is my shout out to the spiritual giftings, which I was also going to include. But um, yeah, it says that the spiritual gifts, the apostles, the preachers, the, the pastors, the shepherds, they were all put in place to equip the church and to build them up into the measure and the stature and the fullness of Christ. Again, like their purpose is to change us into the likeness of God. So that is the final blessing. So yeah, that's, that's it. That's really all my points. But yeah, my last encouragement is, as you seek God and seek his face, like expect to be transformed into his likeness. Amen. Well done. Well, well done. Well, can we give it up for our five and five speakers? Come on, somebody. Yeah, you guys did so great. Oh, how many of you were blessed today? I felt, I felt an automatic flush in my spirit. Whew. Praise the Lord. I feel clean. <laughs>